welcome back, Mom and Dr. Jones, OBGYN and Mob24. Today I'm doing a question. Mm -mm, I'm not doing a question. I'm doing a video. I'm making a video. Today I'm doing a video answering some of the questions that you have left in the comment section. I feel bad that I can't answer every question that you guys leave me, especially the ones that are personal medical questions because you have to ask your personal doctor those. But when you ask for extra information on something or ask my opinion on something, I wanted to start making some videos that was answering questions from the comment section. So that's gonna be the first in the answering your questions series, which is like what I do on the whole channel, but this is different. It's new. We're answering questions today. If you haven't checked out the merch store, we have You Don't Get To Be Offended By Science and Science Is Inclusive shirts on Teespring at the link below. First question is from Midnight Zelda. I have a question that has little to nothing to do with this video. What are your views about placentophagy? I've heard good things and I've heard bad things and they usually contradict each other. Is it dangerous or recommended? So to talk about this, we have to talk about what is placentophagy. Placentophagy is a mixture of two words, placent, which is placenta, the afterbirth. It helps baby get oxygenated blood. It helps keep dangerous substances away from the baby in utero, and it kind of filtrates everything as well. The placenta is actually really amazing. It's almost like a lung and a liver and a kidney all meshed together, which is super awesome. It's a really incredible organ. The phagy part is to ingest. I think it comes from the Latin root for to ingest. And so this is eating your placenta after birth. I can personally say I never had a desire to do this, but sometimes people are interested in it because they think it might decrease the risk of postpartum depression or help with their nutrient status. We don't have science that supports either of those ideas. We do have some case reports that this could be potentially harmful, but they're few and far between. The risk is probably there. I mean, you have to imagine that this is an organ, so eating anything like that is going to have the same foodborne illness risks of anything else, in addition to any kind of uh, infectious agents that a placenta could carry. If you have it encapsulated, I always have a concern about who's encapsulating the placenta. Nobody is coming in and making sure that that equipment is cleaned between people. The last person could have had any kind of illness or bloodborne pathogen, things like HIV. There's no regulatory body making sure that this is being done safely. So this isn't something I can support from a scientific standpoint, but it's also not something I can say is so incredibly dangerous that I should warn you about it here. Personally, if I'm looking at the science saying, what is the benefit? And we're not really finding that. And I'm looking at the science saying, what is the risk? And it's saying it's small, but it, it's real. Then I don't think that's a risk I would want to take, and I also don't have an interest in eating my placenta in general. But if somebody does, that's a science. Not a lot of support, not a ton of negative, but there could be some very serious negatives. That was a very long-winded answer. I'm gonna have to answer faster if we wanna get through more than two questions. This question is from Peyton Winstead Norwood. What are your thoughts on at-home insemination kits like Mosey Baby? Home insemination is a way that people can overcome some barriers to pregnancy without having to go through true assisted reproductive technology. In my practice, the most common way that I would see people using this would be a lesbian couple who needed a sperm donor and they could order a sperm donation from somewhere like the Seattle Sperm Bank, and then they would inject that sample with a little syringe into the vaginal vault. It's cheaper than going the full assisted reproductive route if there's no overt fertility issues going on that need to be overcome. Another type of couple who would be really benefited from this would be people who have a heteronormative relationship, so a cis male and a cis female, but for whatever reason they can't or don't want to have vaginal intercourse. They can also collect the ejaculate and inject it into the vaginal vault and try to attempt pregnancy that way. Again, I've had people be very successful with this, so I would say that in general, home insemination, if done according to your doctor's guidance, is an option for some people in certain situations, definitely need to talk to your doctor about it first. If they're surprised because they don't know about it, have them look it up because I think the first time I heard about it, I was like, oh, I don't know if you should be doing that at home, but I, I think that it actually can be a really good option for some people. The Mosey Baby Kit, I don't know. I mean, to me, it looks like a very expensive syringe. I'm not sure what all it includes. I mean, it has some instructions and it has syringes and a collection cup. like. 
I don't know, for 89 bucks, I feel like you could just get some regular syringes. This question is from Jamie McIver. Is the cervix kind of like a Chinese finger trap? Not that it's going to trap anything, but it's long and skinny and moves to short and fat, kind of. It actually is kind of long and thick as the baby's head moves down it kind of expands up. The best demonstration I've seen of this is where someone put a ping pong ball into a balloon that had been inflated. I don't know how to explain it. I'm gonna try to throw a video in here that explains it better. So this video is from Liz Chalmers. You can see the link in the description to watch her full video, but what she's demonstrating here are contractions as she squeezes the top of that balloon that represents the uterus, and that little bottom part of the balloon represents the cervix. The cervix is getting shorter and thinner, but it's not like it goes away. This is extremely accurate to how this cervix is as contractions happen and the cervix thins and dilates to allow for the baby to move down into the vaginal canal. So not really like a Chinese finger trap, although you're bringing back lots of fun memories from my childhood with that question. Sadie's T says, what is your take on yoni or detox pearls? I need to do a whole video on ways that people make money by telling you that something is wrong with your vagina when it's not, but this is one of those things. Your vagina is a self-cleaning oven. You don't need to put any pearls or detoxes inside it to do anything with it or fix it. All you need to do is use an unscented gentle soap on the outside of the labia, nothing on the inside, no douching, no yoni pearls, no detoxes, nothing. If you have a problem going on, odor, pain, itching, painful intercourse, weird discharge, your vagina's on fire, anything going on, then you need to talk to your doctor, advanced practice provider, and definitely not put any yoni pearls or detoxes inside of it. This is a scam for people to make money by capitalizing off of insecurities that have been put there by basically media and pop culture. So your vagina is perfect like it is. If it has a problem or it's sick, take it to the doctor. Otherwise, unscented soap and plain water, or even just plain water, that's okay too. Whatever makes you happy, but no scents, no fragrances, and no douches, nothing inside. That's it, that's all, that's all I got. <laughs> so Kataya Wolf says, I'm extremely late to this video, but was the laundry soap brand Purcell? Because if so, the same thing happened to me and I wasn't pregnant. So this is a question in relation to me telling a story of me putting a laundry detergent into my dishwasher for like a week before I realized it. And I realized it because all my dishes started tasting like soap and it was disgusting. Yes, the brand was Purcell, which is hilarious because it was the first time I had ever bought that brand, which is why I guess I didn't recognize that it was laundry detergent. But if more than one person has done this, then maybe Purcell is at fault and needs to work on their branding and marketing so that us pregnant and not pregnant people know that it's not dish soap. I'm sure it says right on the package, laundry detergent, but something about it made us think that it went in the dishwasher and not the laundry, so I'm suing. Susan Clennon says, were you able to contact her and get help? This is a question from my premature ovarian failure video about a woman who had been seen and essentially has premature ovarian failure most likely, and just seemed to have been written off by the medical community. Yes, actually she saw that video or one of you guys sent it to her somehow we did get in contact. I was so ecstatic that you were able to connect me to her or that that video eventually got to her. So we have chatted. Obviously, I'm not gonna share any of that here, but she's doing well and I appreciate that you guys were so caring in that video and so worried about trying to get us in touch. <laughs> I don't know how this one got in here, but all of my comments are not nice questions of people looking for more information. Sassy K says, please, can you provide an update to this video? Some of the information is not conclusive. This question was on my last COVID and pregnancy video, and you're so right. Some of that information is not conclusive. Some of the information we have now is still not conclusive, but I am working on an update to that video. I'm so sorry it's delayed, but I will have a COVID and pregnancy update very, very, very soon. Thank you for your patience. Oh, this is a really interesting question from Emo Baby Spain. Can we talk about a decidual cast and how you can tell the difference from a really early term miscarriage? I just thought this question was really cool because a lot of people don't know about decidual cast. What a decidual cast is, is basically a, how do I describe this? Instead of having your period where the endometrial tissue kind of comes out in clumps or chunks and goes into the toilet, someone will have that lining come out all as one piece. You know, like when you cook scrambled eggs and they kind of 
get overcooked on the bottom of the pan and then it peels off as like one burnt egg pan lining. This is a really horrible description. It's like that. Instead of coming out in pieces, the decidual cast comes out all at one time and it's the endometrial lining shedding all together. It's often shaped like a uterus. It's really jarring to some people if they haven't seen it before because it can look like a miscarriage or a placenta or something weird. Sometimes people have no idea what's happening and it really worries them, but it's not worrisome. Most people will never experience or see it, but it's not scary or dangerous. How can you tell the difference between that and an early miscarriage? I would say most of the time, if you have an early miscarriage, the only way to definitively tell that is to have known that you were pregnant. Obviously we could tell if we looked at it with pathology, but pathology is pretty expensive. I don't know that most people would want to pay to have pathologists look at it just to find out. But I thought just answering the, you know, question about what a decidual cast is would be really interesting to some people because I know I don't think I had even heard of that until I was in residency. So it's really interesting to me. Noelle Tinker, have you ever watched Call the Midwife? I love that show. I watched almost the entire series when I was on maternity leave with my youngest son. And I've actually done a couple of Call the Midwife reaction videos on the channel, which I'll link below. I always say that and I never link them, but I'm gonna try really hard to remember. So yes, I love that show. I'll try to do another reaction to it soon. It's sometimes hard for me to react to it because one, it's all so good and realistic that I wanna just keep talking about it. And so they end up being really, really long and they take me forever to film and edit, but they're full of great information. So I need to do another one soon. Oh, this is a really good question. Leda Hageman. Sorry if I'm pronouncing everybody's names wrong. It's not on purpose. Does it matter to doctors if we are on our period during an exam? No, it does not matter to your doctor. If you're coming in for an exam and it's for heavy bleeding or something like that, we've been there. We do exams on people who are actually bleeding to death from their vagina. We are very used to doing exams in very bloody situations. People who are having miscarriage, people are having massive uterine bleeding, people who are anticoagulated. This doesn't bother us at all. Some patients would prefer in the absence of an emergency situation to not have their GYN exam done when they are on their menstrual cycle. And that's totally fine too. So it's completely up to you, but it definitely doesn't bother your doctor. If you're getting a pap smear done, most of the time, as long as you're not having really, really heavy bleeding, it's still okay to get your pap smear done, but that's a question for your doctor. So this question is from Yaus Jose and I definitely mispronounced that and I'm really sorry. The question is, do they have two different period cycles? So this question was on a video about uterine didelphus, which is where someone has a duplicated system of the uterus. So they have two uteri and sometimes two services also. And they wanna know, do they have different period cycles? And the answer is no. The menstrual cycle is hormonally controlled, meaning it doesn't matter how many uteri you have, they're going to sync up based on your hormones. So you'll have bleeding at the same time, which is one reason that a lot of people, if they have this, they don't even know. They find out like when they're pregnant or at their C-section or something like that, when they're diagnosed with infertility or they have an MRI done for some other reason. Most of the time, this is an incidental finding, meaning we weren't looking for it. This kind of plays into also when I had talked about on Twitter not too long ago to say, you can't have a menstrual cycle while you're pregnant. Yes, you can have bleeding in pregnancy, but it's not a menstrual cycle because the menstrual cycle is hormonally controlled. That hormone level, the one that causes you to have a period is in direct opposition to the one that is necessary to maintain a pregnancy. High progesterone in pregnancy, a sudden drop in progesterone to induce a menstrual cycle. So they are opposites and they don't happen at the same time. And that's the same reason why if you have a uterus on either side and one is pregnant and the other is not, you don't have a period from the other uterus during the pregnancy because high progesterone prevents periods from coming. No periods during pregnancy and one period from two different uteruses at the same time. Make sense? Baby doll, can you be my gynae? <laughs> Well, if you live close to where I work, maybe, but right now I'm actually only working hospital shift work, so I don't have my own personal GYN patients. I take care of patients kind of like in an ER, except it's patients who are in labor or they have GYN emergencies or things like that. I don't have my own private clinic right now, so the answer is no, but when I do someday again, absolutely make an appointment, I'll be your gyno. I really miss that part of my job, but this is the best thing for us right now. Oh, another one that accidentally slipped in. VF says, oh, damn it, you went political. Was hoping if I subscribed to medical channels, I'd be spared the political bullshit, but nowhere is safe, unsubscribe. First VF, 
This is not an airport and it's not necessary to announce your departure. Yes, I stole that from a meme, but I like it and I'm using it as if it were my own, just like every other joke that I ever tell. Second, medicine and politics are highly intertwined. I would absolutely love it if medicine and specifically pregnancy and gynecology had not been hijacked by politics. But the truth of the matter is, they have. And for that reason, this channel has always been and will always be a place where we sometimes discuss politics and legislation that affect the people that I take care of and the people that I am educating. It's an important, necessary thing that we have to talk about. Politics is not my favorite thing to talk about, but it's important and it affects your healthcare directly. You cannot pretend that politics does not affect almost everything I discuss on this channel. So I'm sure not watching this VF because you let us all know loudly that you unsubscribe. Totally cool, nobody's required to stay, but this is my channel and I'm gonna talk about the important issues here. Teresa Molina says, can I report you to the medical board for being freaking awesome? Yes, Teresa, you can. Direct all medical board awesomeness to ABOG. Website has the address and please just handwrite letters to them. Take a picture on, post it on social media first. I'm kidding. You can send me a letter to my PO box. It was about to change, so I'm gonna update it to a new PO box, but if you ever send me anything to the PO box, know that it makes my heart happy. Monty Ali says, question for you. Why were hysterectomies so routine in years gone by? My mom's generation all had them. I almost thought they were given liberally to Catholics who couldn't use birth control any other way. Correct me if I'm wrong. The reason that hysterectomies were so prevalent in the past is actually, in my opinion, two different things. So one of them is, in the past, we didn't have a lot of options for treating all of the GYN problems that we have more options to treat today. IUDs and hormonal medications that are safe and effective and can treat some heavy bleeding and abnormal bleeding. We have medications that can even treat early endometrial cancer, which is uterine cancer. We had all of these new developments in the past couple of decades that allow us to decrease the number of hysterectomies that we have to do. So that's one thing, medical advancements and the willingness of patients and physicians to work together to find a non-surgical solution for the patient's problem. Obviously it doesn't always work. I still do a lot of hysterectomies, but I definitely try to do medical management first in someone who is trying to avoid surgery. And that's unique, It not to me like, unique to this time in medicine. It definitely isn't something that OBGYNs did often in the past. And then the other thing, other than medical advancements, is cultural shifts. So it used to just be a thing, especially I think, and I mean, this is just me speculating, but when gynecology was largely male dominated field, they would just jump to surgery really quickly. And we've really tried hard to reduce the amount of surgeries that we do if we can safely do that a lot of times medical management is safer than doing a giant surgery so it kind of just used to be viewed as a rite of passage something everybody got and now if we can safely avoid it we do i truly appreciate you being here helping me hit 500,000 subscribers and giving me a moment of your day to learn something about pregnancy and gynecology be kind to yourself to each other to me in the comments, be kind, and I will see you next time.